uh, I've slightly changed the uh, uh, title of the chapter because we're going to spend really time talking about uh, intrusions. And another quasi-apology is that I'm going to talk about plumes and intrusions because I showed you as an example the intrusion of the volcanic uh, plume of Redoubt. Intrusions fit with uh, plumes in some way. That was the first thing that uh, Morton Taylor and Turner did is to look at where it intruded. But some people will put intrusions in with gravity currents, which I'm going to talk about next uh, chapter. Six of one, half a dozen of the other. I could have put it in later, but I've uh, put it in uh, now. But here you see the plume that I showed you in the uh, first uh, bit of uh, chapter two, and here's a, an uh, intrusion. And it's the intrusions now that we want to uh, concentrate on. But I'm just going to summarize a little bit of the plume because it's, it's been so long in uh, my knowledge that I didn't maybe explain it as well as I uh, could. Here's a red dyed plume, and I showed you this uh, um, before, that has quite some kinetic energy, and that's uh, increased by the buoyancy difference as it goes up. It takes fluid in through these turbulent eddies, and it expands. And you see that it takes fluid in because it expands. If it happened to uh, disperse the fluid the other way, if there were somehow or other eddies here that put it, uh, took it apart, it would do the exact opposite. It would uh, contract. And the reason it does that is there's no kinetic energy here at all, uh, but there's quite a bit of kinetic energy here. And that energy feeds uh, the eddies. And I'd like to show you that on a video. Um, so you see here the eddies taking in the fluid, turning around, bringing in the fluid, and that's how the entrainment uh, takes place. Uh, so there's the kinetic en energy here, uh, nothing going on here except the entrainment taking in the uh, fluid. Right. Now, We've explained this part. It uh, mixes in more and more with this. It was originally, if you like, very light. Now it's uh, less uh, light because it's come in, taken in this relatively heavy fluid. And we're imagining it's on a uh, uh, gradient. So eventually it gets to its same density level, which is indicated by these uh, red uh, lines. It has some momentum, because it's got some velocities that cones up here, which we calculated. So it overshoots, and then it comes uh, down again and travels out along uh, here. And it's what goes on here that we want to talk about. Now I have another apology to make. This is going to be a lecture full of apologies, I'm afraid. Is I was asked. Uh, whether uh, dimensional analysis and similarity uh, solutions will always uh, work. And I didn't give a very good answer, I don't think. And what's most embarrassing is I'm going to show you here some examples where they don't work. And I'd totally forgotten that <laughs> when I gave the answer. I have to tell you, an hour and a half for me to lecture is a little too long, <laughs> so <laughs> I apologize that. But I'll, you'll see what uh, goes on. Well, we want to know what uh, happens uh, here. And that's uh, the idea. But let me just draw a diagram so you have it all uh, in mind, what it'll look like. Here's the plume that comes up, that overshoots, and then is going to intrude. And we would like to know, let me just draw it on one side. Everything is axisymmetric. Um, so this is not rotation, this just says <laughs> it's uh, actually symmetric. It intrudes on uh, one side. There's a constant buoyancy level, a uh, buoyancy frequency uh, that I'll just draw as n squared uh, here. That means that in the far field here, the density is linear. So this is rho is a function of uh, z. And clearly, here, where uh, nothing has happened, it's going to be exactly the same. And here, where nothing has happened, it must also be exactly the same. 
but there's going to be a difference here and this is all mixed up it's a unstable situation and so what must happen is that it it's at the uniform density between those two so this is uniform density there's a density jump here and a density jump here and what that uh, means is that the pressure here is different from the pressure here because this has this amount of this density fluid and then a gradient above it and this point has this amount of this mixed fluid and then the gradient and that pressure difference is going to drive the flow and that's really what's driving the intrusion and we're going to work that out and see how quickly it will go Well, uh, so uh, when you say this amount, th this mean value is because we're mixing it up. This has to stay the same as this, and this has to stay the same as that. But in here, there are differences at the top and the bottom of the density, and so it must be at the mean value because it's mixing this up. Yeah. Oh, here, here they have a different hydrostatic. Uh, pressure above them because the hydrostatic pressure depends on the density and this character has let me exaggerate a large amount of this uniform density and then it trapers off but this character uh, has a relatively small amount of uh, the uniform density in the trap so there's a difference in pressure let me draw the the, uh, the example through here if I can draw it parallel So this character here, we're all in the uh, interior, this character here has this gradient of density above him, but this character here has much more dense fluid, to exaggerate slightly, much more dense fluid and then it goes back and it looks exactly the same. So this and this and this, the, the pressure is going to be, sorry that's a horizontal line, the pressure is going to be, we're meant to be a horizontal line. It is not a horizontal <laughs> line. Uh, it's meant to be a horizontal line. So this character sees the extra pressure due to a uniform density of this amount, but this uh, character sees the extra pressure which is a ever decreasing density. And so the pressure here, P1 call it here, and P, let's call it zero here because it's the end, uh, P1 is greater than P0, and if I make this x, that says uh, dp dx is less than 0, and so you're going to have a, a du dt proportional to minus dp dx, i.e. du dt is going to be positive, and we're going to get a positive term. We think so. It looks like it is there, and we'll have to see what that's like. Yeah. Uh, but the density decreases as you go up. The, this, uh, this, this uh, density no will stay at the same because it's the value of this. So this is uh, sorry. I should have made. This will always be at the same density because this has got to be the density again. Another horizontal line. Here, this mean has to be the density of this horizontal line just because it's mixing. It's just the, thickness the thickness will uh, change. This will, this density will all be the same because it's mixed up, and it'll be the density at this level of the uh, profile because that's the level at which it's intruding. If it intruded up here, it would be heavy. Uh, it would uh, be he heavier than the medium and it would fall down if it intruded here would be lighter and it would come up so it gets up there okay and please do interrupt and ask questions okay um, well here's now summarizing and I've shown you this before we've got entrainment fluid uh, coming in uh, it turns out and I think that's the best way to put it that it's pretty much conical it wasn't until one did the experiments that one would have noticed that that's conical. It could be something else, but it isn't. It is uh, conical, and then there's the latrines, but it intrusion, and that's what we want to uh, analyze. 
Well, here's uh, Redoubt, and we'll use this just as a sort of a, a symbol. Uh, and the important thing, well, I think is important, is uh, that the Met Office, the Meteorological Office in uh, um, Britain, which was uh, in fact set up by Fitzroy, the master of the Beagle, who visited uh, uh, India uh, on his uh, voyage. Uh, the Met Office got a special program called NAME, and I've forgotten now what NAME stands for, but uh, uh, which said they could describe this by advection diffusion. Advection means the u dot grad u term in the equations, and diffusion means kappa del squared u. So somehow, well, not somehow, but they wrote down the equations and they had a big numerical scheme uh, in which they analysed this by saying it's advected along due to, or controlled by diffusion. And what I'm going to say is that we should cross out all of those, well, maybe not cross out the Met Office, but advection diffusion, as I'll show you, is not important at all. The name is, in my opinion, totally incorrect. But I'll show you that uh, uh, nearer the end, because I'm going to show you something different. The first is to say, well, let's have a look at this. We'd like to know how the radius varies with time. How rapidly does it spread out? We'd like to know how the height, and I really should have written h is a function of both radius and time, but a typical h, due to the input here, there's a volume of flux comes out here, it goes up as we've said, it comes down again, and then after all the mixing and everything, there's some volume flux, and I put the 2 pi in here so that I can get rid of the 2 pi's uh, elsewhere, but q is the flux. So what are the parameters that play a role? Clearly the volume flux, Q plays a role. The buoyancy frequency must play a role here. It must make a big difference if this is really very uh, density stratified, in which case uh, there's a greater pressure, or if it's not stratified at all, well then it'll hardly move into it. And another important point is what's called the Froude number at the nose, and then I'm going to um, explain to you more when we talk about gravity currents, and that's why maybe in some sense it could go there. But this nose moves so that the velocity over g prime, or what's normally called g prime, whoops, the square root of g prime h, which is called the Froude number, it's a non-dimensional number, and it's about 1. And what that says, root g prime h, where the density difference G prime is due to this density difference. Let's call this delta rho. So G prime is G as always delta rho over rho. This is the speed of internal gravity waves on this surface. This is the speed at which it's uh, moving. And this is at the front, I should have emphasised this, at the front. That's called the Froude number and that's at about 1. What it says is that this is controlled so that uh, it goes at about 1. It goes at about the speed of gravity waves, roughly at the speed of gravity waves. H is non-zero at the front. Uh, we're, we're really, as you see here, H is not zero at the front. It tends to be a rather flat uh, front. Um, a, uh, a typical gravity wave on a free surface will look like this and we take this to be the height h. Again, it's not quite at uh, the uh, front. Um, oh, and I was going to say this comes, well, one way of writing it is to say Bernoulli's equation says that p plus one half rho u squared is equal to a constant. And so if we go up uh, here, what's the change in pressure between here and uh, here? Uh, and that must be taken care of by uh, the velocity. So this is just a consequence of uh, Bernoulli's uh, equation. Okay, so we have the... 
a difference in density between the intrusion and the outside. So this, sorry, I should have made that clearer maybe. This is delta. The jump. The jump, yeah. That's the difference in density. Okay. Uh, so we've said that 2 pi q or q, the volume flux driving this intrusion must play a role. The buoyancy frequently must uh, play a role. And the fruit number at the nose or the front, which is roughly one, we'll talk later about exactly how big it is, but it's roughly one, that must play a role. Well, it's obvious what you do now. You use just dimensional analysis and you can get the whole result without any effort. Q, you see, is L cubed T to the minus 1. N is a frequency. It has T to the minus 1. And now what we want to determine is H is a function of R and uh, uh, T. And that has, uh, whoops, I think dimensions are so important I generally use uh, uh, equal si uh, identically equal sign. We want to see if we can get U at the front, which I'll call R naught. So I'll use this. So U at R naught, which is uh, LT to the minus 1. And that's going to depend somehow on time, which, surprise, surprise, has dimensions uh, t. So how are we going to do this? Well, we've got to get u to be lt to the minus 1. The only way we can get an l is from q. That's only where lp is. So and this is a cube. So it must be proportional to q to the one-third. That gets us the L. Now we uh, want to uh, get uh, um, the appropriate time. And we have this, but we already have something uh, here. Uh, and we can get a zero dimension out of this. So what we can write is some function, and we'll work that out in a minute, of n times t. Right, that, that has no dimension, so that's going to be. And, but now we've got an L, t to the minus a third. So to make that uh, appropriate, it has to be t to the minus two-thirds, because we want the velocity to go like L over T. The velocity goes like L over T. Why don't you have N to the power two-thirds? Well, because I'm just put using this T here. The, this is dimensionally correct. It says LT to the minus one is equal to LT to the minus one. Oh, I haven't explicitly said, but this is dimensionless. Uh, I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, because I want to know how this goes with time. I don't want to put in an N here. I could put in an N here. But, uh, well, let me just uh, wait. You could, you could play around with an Absolutely point. That's the important point. You could uh, play around. So, uh, saying exactly what Dishan said, though in different words, you can't get a unique solution here. Because this function could be anything. That's the same as saying you could uh, play around uh, with it. So you might go like t to the minus two-thirds, but it might go like t to the 300th or something if this function was uh, nt to the 300 plus two-thirds. <laughs> Absolutely right. So this is an example where dimensional analysis, I'm afraid, doesn't give you the answer. doesn't give you anything wrong. The answer had better fit into this, as uh, Ishan says, but it doesn't tell you. Dimensional analysis by itself doesn't tell you what the f is. And physics won't tell you, well, in a sense, physics won't tell you either. You have to do something uh, better. So, no unique solution.
Okay, so, well, dimensional analysis is not going to be sufficient, but we're going to keep it in mind. Uh, and the first thing that we'll think about is, let's just do a sort of a conservation relationship. Let's say that the square of the radius times some typical height, so that's going to be a, a, a volume, is going to look a little bit like QT, because this is the volume that's being put in here and r squared h is typical of the volume. So we're now equating volumes, not absolutely equal to because there's questions, h of course varies, but a typical h and this ought to be correct within a factor or so. Now we're going to use this criterion of uh, the uh, Froude number and <coughs> g prime, the difference in density is related to n, so we get u over, and the 2 comes in, uh, and because of the uh, half uh, jump there, uh, the 2 comes in, 2u over nh, which is rn dot, the rate at which the nose uh, propagates over nh is equal to the Froon number that's about 1. So we've gone beyond dimensional analysis, this has to be dimensionally correct, because it's uh, the correct uh, balance, and we've managed to find out what f of n t is. It goes like t to the plus two thirds, not the minus two thirds, because this function has is linear in n t. So here we couldn't work out. There was no unique solution, infinite number of solutions. Here we find three quarters FR, that doesn't matter, that's like uh, one. NQ to the one third, that if you like is uh, what uh, um, Ishan uh, stated. Uh, T to the uh, two thirds, and that's what you've got just by conservation. Okay, and this was done by my one time uh, graduate student, Woods, and quite a number of people basically uh, did that. Is that, sorry, is that... Is that based on observation? Uh, I'll, I'll talk about that later, but yeah. It, well, it's either about one comes from here, where you get the square root of two, uh, 1.41, or observations make it about 1.2. So the fruit number in theory is, uh, well, not, is equal to root two. And uh, an experiment, it's equal to 1.2. Huh. I've forgotten the next digit, and it doesn't matter, probably. How did I get the square root of 2? Because I've said here p plus a half row u squared. As I, let me make a, a simple version. Here's the uh, current coming uh, through. Uh, there's a different pressure here and here, but there's a streamline that will go up like that. Maybe I should make, th make it in the domain where that is equal to zero. And the pressure difference, and the pressure difference will be due to the fact that here it's all of one density. The pressure here uh, is of a different, and that pressure has to drive up um, P is rho GH, whoops, maybe I should write that down, P is rho GH, <coughs> and this has to be a constant uh, by Bernoulli, <coughs> and so I get that at the front, delta sorry, delta uh, well yeah, well delta rho G, I was just saying rho GH in general, the pressures, the density times the uh, time J. Okay, so then I get this fruit number relationship. Okay, so would, uh, and so that's uh, the root two is, uh, as I say, on theory, experiment at 1.2, roughly one. And Woods, my ex-graduate student, and a number of people did exactly that. Okay, that's pretty simple to do. Say this is 
that depends what you w how you use the words phenomenology. It's a little bit similar. People have occasionally said, but that's obvious. And I said, well, I don't know what the word obvious <laughs> means. And I had a, an argument with the Australian Prime Minister. He said something. I said, that's absolutely correct. He said, it's obvious, isn't it? And I said, no, not at all. And he said, but you t told me it was correct. I said, yeah, it was correct, but it's not obvious. And then he made what got him stabbed in the back. He said, but every man in the street would understand this. This was about climate change. And I said, no, 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 they wouldn't understand this. He was talking about nonlinear feedbacks and everything. So, uh, <coughs> uh, now, uh, is it uh, phenomenological, you said, yeah? yeah. I don't know exactly what that word means. It's, it's not exact. It's balancing um, terms, if you like. It's using conservation in a no, general way. The, the phone number about the one, yeah. Oh, um, no, well, as I say, you can use this uh, theory to show that it should be root two. Well, and, and to anticipate, what happened is von Kármán, a very famous uh, Hungarian uh, <coughs> fluid dynamicist who uh, then went to uh, America, uh, was asked to look into this uh, problem. Well, I'll tell you why. Because the uh, Americans were thinking about well, that was against the law in World War II, to release poisonous gas. And uh, they wanted to know how rapidly the gas would propagate to, of course, go towards the enemy, not towards them, and what the influence would be of a wind uh, and how large a wind would bring the poisonous gas back onto uh, their own troops. So they asked von Kármán, who was living in America at the time, and uh, he came up with this idea and did the theory that's basically like this and said the fruit number was equal to root 2. In those days you didn't do experiments, but let me <laughs> tell you when you do, and I have done this, I, that's why I'm uh, embarrassed that I can't remember the next number, because <laughs> it's my measurement. Um, uh, it's not r exactly root 2, but that's because of the mixing and things that take place. Okay. Oh, well, I, 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 sorry, when I write this, what I really just wanted to say is that pressure goes like rho GZ or rho GH. To look properly what the pressure is, yeah, I have to work out exactly what the difference is here and here, and it depends whether it's stratified or not. But yeah, th this is just a uh, symbolic way. This is a symbolic way of writing the pressure, but that comes into here, uh, and this is the result that you uh, get. Now, okay, so we've got that just by conservation, in a sense, balancing. Phenomenological, the more I think about it, I think that's a little bit of a hard term, but I, that's reasonable. But how I will interpret what Ishan said, which is, in my opinion, totally correct, is you want to do this on a, put it on a much firmer basis. You want to make sure that this is the right answer. So you write down the equations and see what happens here. Here's local continuity that's uh, basically saying that if we have uh, the intrusion, let me exaggerate slightly the intrusion, then it looks like this, and the flux here, which is, I'll leave out 2 pi, 2 pi equal to 1, uh, RUH, 2 pi R is around there, the velocity times the H, so we'll write this, how we write that as Q. But here we have a Q plus delta Q, because it's not exactly the same because the velocity is going to be different here and the height is going to be different. And if delta Q is less than zero, i.e. more stuff comes up here than goes through here, what has to happen by conservation and volume, and that's not... <laughs> <coughs> anything but absolutely correct, there has to be a change in uh, H. So that's what local continuity says. The time rate of change of H is going to be related to the radial change in the flux, which is RUH. And the 1 on R comes in just because of the geometry. That, that's the local continuity equation. <coughs> now, 
we tend, because it's easier, not to write down the f what really would be the momentum equation, the Navier-Stokes equation, which is ut plus uh, u dot grad. The u is equal to the right-hand side. But we add the local continuity equation to it, so we have now here hut. But that's just because we've added this. You can look upon this as u of t plus u du dx comes uh, here when we add this and it's because it takes this nice simple form and then we have the pressure gradient which we talked about here uh, and the pressure gradient is related to uh, n squared because that tells you uh, what this uh, jump is. So this is the Navier-Stokes equation if you like and this is now the global continuity equation. It just says totally the amount here <coughs> has to equal the amount that's put in. Is it R H U or just H U? It's just H O. No, 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 ah, because I've got a DR here. No, that's it's U. No, I think that's right, but l let me Okay, now what I'm going to do now, I've got the equations, in a minute I'm going to solve them, but at the moment I'm going to say, look I used uh, um, <coughs> uh, the uh, dimensional analysis got me nothing as I've written over there, then I uh, went a little more, uh, I tried to uh, balance uh, terms and I got uh, a statement, which maybe I should have written down, uh, uh, balance, let's put, uh, says that you went like t to the one-third, isn't it, nq, is that right, it is t to the one-third from this, whoops, t to the two-thirds, sorry, I can never remember these expands, there are too many to remember. Uh, NQ to the one third. Oh, that's uh, that's why I got it wrong. Yeah, <coughs> sorry. Thank you very much, Ishan. Um, R goes like t to the two thirds. Yeah, I uh, had these uh, different. Well, maybe I should have now written if the velocity goes like t to the minus uh, two thirds. Uh, well, I can't. Because there's a time in here, I can't integrate this. I'd like to say that makes Rn goes like, but <coughs> there's going to be another function. I could uh, do that. In fact, I'll set that as homework. Uh, what does R go like? And I can use the same thing. How must you uh, work it out? It must still go like... Que q to the one-third, because it's the only way you're going to get a uh, length. And now you must get rid of all the uh, times. Well, I, I guess I could do that. It's q to the one-third times some other function, let's call it psi. You can always add that in. That's a, a pity. You don't know what uh, uh, that is. Uh, this has dimensions l t to the minus a third, uh, t to the minus a third, so this must go like t to the one-third, all right? But that doesn't tell you how it goes like time because this character could cause an enormous uh, difficulty. Uh, but what we've done, that, that was just by dimensional analysis. So this is just dimensional analysis, this board. <coughs> doesn't get you a solution. Now we balance the... Uh, in a sense, making conservation, and that tells us, whoops, this should go like this, that R goes like T to the two-thirds. That's just from a balance. Yeah? The argument that T1 is greater than T0 is uh, you are using the hydrostatic balance. Yeah. But there is a radial split, so the velocity is decreasing as you go along R. So uh, the pressure well, we're really assuming that the, uh, well, that's another question we could look into. I'm just using a general velocity, but we would want to calculate what the velocity is as a function of position. 
Sure, th this is a typical, if you like, uh, velocity, and I'll uh, evaluate that in a moment. So we got this just by um, balancing terms. Uh, now we write down the equation, so of course the next thing to do is to balance the terms, not to solve it, because we can balance the terms quite quickly. We'll solve it in a minute, but that takes more time. Local continuity, you see, leads nothing to nothing, because the two R's balance uh, out. U is R over T, so that balances out with that one, and we're left with the H over T is roughly the same as H over T. Well, that doesn't tell you anything. But the momentum equation does tell you something. All these three terms must balance. If this one didn't come into uh, the balance, then it wouldn't drive it because it's that that's driving the motion because there is a density difference. If this one didn't come into uh, the balance, uh, then there'd be no time variation. <laughs> and this is a time evolving uh, business. And this is at all at high Reynolds number. I haven't quite said that, but this is at high Reynolds number. And this is the U dot grad U term, which, whether you like it or not, comes in. Fluid mechanics would be much easier if it didn't play a role, <laughs> but it does play a role. So all these three terms uh, must balance in the momentum uh, equation. And this, uh, and this uh, uh, cancel each other. This is of, uh, R squared over uh, T squared. One of the R's cancel here, and you get R, uh, uh, R H over T. And this is also R over T, and so you get uh, th those two are exactly the same. And, what you, uh, and this one is going to then balance these two. So what you find by that is that R over T squared has to balance N H squared over R, they're balancing these terms. These ter two terms are the same. And what that tells you is that the H has to go like R over N times T. Then you've got the global continuity equation, which basically says that Rn squared over T times H has got to be roughly uh, Q. So when you get H out of here, we get that Rn goes like no constant in front, of course, nq to the one-thirds, t to the two-thirds, and here we have it. So what we've said is a global understanding of what must be going on here is in agreement with just balancing the terms of the equation. Well, that's good. If there was disagreement, you'd be in real problems there. Uh, <coughs> I don't know what you... Well, it can't happen. <laughs> there has to be agreement because... Uh, You've not used the argument correctly if it doesn't balance the equation. Okay, now you remember everything that I told you uh, yesterday, of course, which is this must be a similarity, or you assume this must be a similarity form of uh, solution. So it must be that there's some similarity variable here, and you see from this balance uh, how to get something that's non-dimensional, Similarity variables are non-dimensional, nq to the minus a third, r times t to the minus two-thirds. And then the balance says that the uh, velocity will go like t to the minus a third, nq to the one-third, times some function of eta. And I tend to always use a variable that goes from zero to one. I non-dimensionalize eta by e to n, there's some function, that's what we're going to want to work out. What is this uh, function? And the height is going to be appropriately non-dimensionalized, that you can get just from dimensional analysis, times a t to the minus a third, so that it agrees with that, times some other function of g. And then we put it into the equations, because we're really trying to find the f and g. We've done it by balancing, just uh, from uh, understanding the physics, we're going from balancing the equations, now uh, the terms in the equation, now we're really going to uh, solve it. So we get these nonlinear differential equations, Fg here and uh, F squared and G prime by putting it in. And here's the frontal condition that the fruit number at the nose is given by 2F over G at y equals 1. And we start at y equals 1 and we go down. 
And I'll tell you, there's no solution to that. I don't care that this is uh, uh, an equation which has a boundary condition that looks good. There's just no solution. Bonacay's was my uh, <coughs> postdoc, and we derived this together. And then I said to him, "Look, it won't take you long. You're a smart cookie to uh, get the solution." And he said, "I just can't do it." He came back two or three days later, and he said, "It just doesn't work." And I said politely, "Don't be stupid. Of course it uh, works. You must be able to uh, do it." And he came back uh, again and said, "Well, I minimised or made as small as I can the grid steps, and I made it careful, and I checked it, and it still doesn't work." And then I think at that stage I said, gee, that must be because there isn't a solution. And what you got <coughs> was as follows, that you start at y equals 1, uh, you go in, and then there's a shock in the equations. That's okay, he didn't mind that. So there's a big change in u and a big change in h. And then it goes and you calculate U and you calculate uh, H. These are the F and G's that I used uh, before. And then at the, almost at the origin where you want to go, at 0.019, the thing has a singularity. It blows up. And that's why I said to him he'd handled it really badly and he has to take smaller and smaller steps, but it always led to that. Well, eventually, <laughs> I realised that means that there's no similarity solution. But one second, if there's no similarity solution, that must mean, because it's really going on from the balance and it's going on from the equations, that the equations don't have a solution at all. That there must be, I mean, the equations, if I write down the Navier Stokes equations, they must have a solution. But this form that I've been talking to you about for 50 minutes can't be right. There must be some different solution to the full equations. That what I've been telling you, I hate to say it, which is balancing terms and writing down similarity solutions, that can't be the right way it goes. <coughs> Gee. Yeah. But that could be my inability to write. It, it could be uh, uh, Bonacase's inability to solve the equations properly, but after a lot of care, <laughs> I could see he was right. And uh, there just is no solution. If you make the form of equation as a, a form of substitution here, uh, a similarity form of solution which is uh, justified by the uh, balance or by the equations, the balance in the equations, so it follows directly and logically and incontrovertibly, but you're making the assumption that there's a similarity solution. There is the assumption. And so you go through that and then you find you get equations and there's just no solution. You just cannot get, this set of equations doesn't have a solution. Um, ex well, first of all, this argument by Bernoulli, using Bernoulli, yes, says that it's a constant. So the Bernoulli is not quite right. Well, the Bernoulli is quite right. The question is whether the application yeah. here is quite right. Yeah, Bernoulli might not be quite right. It might be that the fruit number somehow changes with time. I wouldn't quite know how to do that. Experimentally, we've, we find that the fruit number is pretty constant at this 1.2. I think you're asking a good question, which if, again, in my words, to make it general, is saying, you've tried out a similarity solution, and there's no such solution. Hence, something must be wrong. And it could be anything. It could be your assumption that there's a similarity solution. It could be that the fruit number being constant uh, what else could it be? I was pointing at your boundary condition at Yeah, yeah. It could be that this somehow changes with time. Uh, if I was a mathematician, 
you could say quite well, well, let this change with time, then it must uh, be possible. I agree with uh, that. Um, you know, when you know that something is wrong, that doesn't tell you what's right. Uh, you, you know that this is wrong, Somet something needs changing because there's no doubt that happens. <laughs> uh, so something needs uh, changing. Uh, and I guess because I'm so used to this fruit number being considered a constant, that I must admit didn't uh, occur to me. Uh, but I thought, gee, maybe the similarity solution. Uh, a similarity form of solution is incorrect. And so, you know what? That's uh, more than the uh, 40 uh, minutes, so I'm going to stop there and give you five minutes to think what should be correct. <laughs> and I'll start in five minutes. Well, we'll uh, start again. Well, to put it in its crudest and bluntest way, what I've just shown to you is that everything I've been talking to you about in the last 50 minutes is incorrect, or maybe not 50 minutes, but 45 minutes. There has to be something else. And an extension of uh, what was uh, put uh, earlier is there could be lots of ways in which you could change and quotes correct it. So I'm going to make one suggestion which I think is reasonable and then we're going to see what it means. Which is to say, look, at one stage it looks a little bit like this and how about I hypothesize, if you like, that a later stage, because this is in agreement with the photographs, so this is time later, it looks like this, more or less, and, at ti uh, and I'm making this thin, or I'm conjecturing it'll thin, I'm going to have to see if that's uh, correct, because that's what I see on the slides, and a little later it'll look uh, like this. And now, here I am, uh, leaning on my experience a little bit. I know that there was a shock when I did that, or two shocks, there was an infinite. So what I'll just guess is that there's going to be some shock here. And I'm just guessing that. That's, uh, and I'm guessing it because that's the right answer. <laughs> but uh, we'll have to prove that that's so. Uh, that it looks uh, really like this. There's some sort of shock here. But more or less that this goes like that. Okay, so that's my hypothesis, and you're quite right. I have to follow it through to see whether it's uh, crazy or uh, not. Oh, I've already shown you that slide. Um, <coughs> but what this says is that except for this front, there's a steady response here, that this part is steady. Of course, there are velocities, but they don't depend on time. So let's just try that out, if you like. Does it make uh, sense? So we write down exactly the same equation, we can't change the equations, but we uh, get rid of the time derivatives. So we just have the local continuity, which uh, says uh, this change in height is uh, due to the difference in flux, the horizontal flux. We have the time dependent, in, sorry, independent momentum equation, basically saying u d u d x or u dot grad u is what I should really say is uh, given by the uh, pressure gradient term here in the usual way that's the momentum equation at the source here we know there's some flux uh, q at uh, some place uh, r naught and then at the nose well we're going to drop that out because there's a shock that goes on at the nose we're going to uh, uh, conjecture um, what you might say is, well, maybe Q isn't a constant. Maybe we should look at something else. Maybe volcanic eruptions, not only maybe, volcanic eruptions definitely don't have a constant Q, but it's as easy as hell in the lab to make a constant Q, so that can't be uh, the uh, solution. Okay, well, um, you integrate uh, both of uh, these, not very difficult. It says that this is a constant and this is a constant. I can do those integrations. u squared plus a quarter n squared h squared is equal to b. Constant. Why do I call it b? 
called this Bernoulli's equation. This is just uh, the Bernoulli's equation which we uh, wrote down here. Now, this is a quadratic, which we're going to have to use with this being a constant, but as you all know, quadratics have two solutions. Okay, well, here's the uh, uh, two solutions. Uh, u squared could be either written in this term or in this term, which h is given by this, where g is a function of r, and it uh, goes like this. It's always, uh, um, we don't yet know what the Bernoulli constant is, uh, but uh, it's always uh, um, going to be so that this is positive. This turns out to be supercritical. If you work out u over g prime h, you find that it's greater than 1. And this is subcritical. It's uh, less than uh, 1. Now you find that you can't get a subcritical solution that will match up with anything at the nose. Uh, you could carry this through and then you find it just doesn't work. So instead, you uh, take the supercritical uh, solution uh, and you say at the radius here where it's uh, coming in um, that uh, it's, we'll just put comparable to 1. That says this is the Bernoulli constant that uh, comes in uh, here and here it, uh, it uh, writes it out. So this is what it will look like. This is the non-dimensionalization, which we uh, don't uh, make such a to-do about. This is the radius uh, as we go out. Uh, and here, uh, u prime and h prime, the non-dimensionalized h and uh, u. So what you uh, see is that h prime gets quite large. It goes uh, down like 1 on r. u prime starts and goes to uh, 1. So what we're saying is that it looks, I mean I'm trying to draw it roughly uh, correct, um, to the source point in here. Uh, what happens is because there's quite a thick plume initially, uh, sorry I shouldn't use the word initially, for small-ish values of R, um, the velocity is rather small, but as h prime goes down, as it gets thinner and thinner, as is observed in uh, intrusions in the lab and in, uh, um, in uh, the atmosphere, uh, the u prime goes to 1. And then, of course, there's the geometry bit, the r, which says that uh, it's r h prime times u that has to be a, a constant. And that's why you can go to a constant here, uh, even though it's in a much thinner part, but the thinner part goes like the radius. Well, OK, so that's the steady uh, solution. Now we're going to have to have an unsteady solution, which is going to be this bit here. There's no doubt that that part is uh, unsteady, and we're going to match it on. So we write down the uh, um, equations again, but we're only going to apply the time-dependent equations at uh, this uh, frontal uh, region uh, here. So we ha and we're going to have some shock here as we sort of uh, conjectured, and we write down the momentum uh, equation, which basically uh, says that the momentum has to be conserved uh, in before and, and behind the shock. And what we get is that the radius goes like, well, this we don't care about that much, but t to the three quarters. That the radius goes like t to the three quarters, and this said it went like t to the two thirds. So it's really quite different, this solution. The difference in uh, th uh, this uh, radius and the steady radius goes like t to uh, the half. So when the time is very much uh, uh, greater than the time given by the inverse buoyancy uh, frequency, that says that this ratio is very much uh, less than one. So it says that the shock 
is pretty small compared to this length scale. It's a rather small shock that uh, works on. So it looks something like this. This is a function of R, and again, it's uh, symmetric, of course, that the shape looks like this. That's the one on R that I drew out here. And this is what it'll look like at, let's say, 25 units of time. This is 50 units of time, 100 units of time. It'll always look like that, gradually thinning. And this shock I drew in by hand, and I exaggerated the size of it. It's not as uh, big as that. We don't see anything as big as that. But the most important uh, thing is that The radius goes like t to the three quarters. It doesn't go as the balance or as the similarity form. Now I'll tell you a terribly sad story. No, oh, I think it's sad. A man called Jörg Imberger, who's one of the world's best limnologists, i.e. studies motions in lakes, looked at an intrusion in a lake and measured the uh, intrusion and he found it went like t to the three quarters. And he wrote this up in a uh, paper and submitted it, and the referees, all of them, said, don't be bloody stupid, it's a well-known fact that it goes like t to the two-thirds. We all uh, know that. It's been published by Woods and Keneally and lots of people. Your experiments must be contaminated by uh, different flux or something was different. So poor old Jorg was very upset, and he published it in a rather minor journal. But of course, now we look at it, went just like t to the three-quarters. <laughs> Perfect uh, uh, fit. Uh, and with the Q and uh, the N. So here you can even get the right results. You can't convince the referees, and it's uh, bad uh, luck. But that's uh, the way it uh, goes. Oh, I've already shown you that, haven't I? So that uh, N head is not that big? No, no, no. I've exaggerated the head. I've, this is a drawn-in head. You can actually calculate it, but I... It's... Yeah, it's mu that's a much better drawing than, than this. This is an exaggeration. That's just a, a more accurate. Okay. Now the wind we saw in one of the slides. Uh, remember with that Russian volcano? Could you sorry. Yeah. How different, enormously different. T to the uh, three quarters and T to the two thirds. The, the, the shapes, the profile. Oh, ah, but, but see, very different in principle because this is steady. This builds up and, and goes steady. Whereas the previous profile, the H changed as with time and position. So if you knew what it was at one time, then the next time or in a significant time later, you'd have to change h, and I've just now forgotten whether it decreases or increases, but it would change. Whereas here I'm saying it stays steady. Okay. So, uh, so this is steady, independent of time, except just at, well, at the front where it moves, uh, and uh, the shock, which has a different shape with how big it is. Now I'm going to say something about uh, the effects of uh, wind. And initially, as you uh, saw in that uh, photograph of that uh, volcanic eruption at K, it just goes up like this, and that's because the wind isn't strong enough to uh, really make much difference. It's going up too rapidly. But eventually, the wind will play a role, and as you saw, it'll drive it down like that. And that's uh, one of the problems uh, that they didn't understand at that time when there was that eruption of E in uh, Iceland. They knew that it was carried uh, down, but they had no idea what the extent would be. How wide would the plume be? Would it be over all of uh, Europe um, or just over a little bit? Just as an aside, because I think it's worthwhile, uh, worthwhile thinking about, different subject, is the question of risk. How do you evaluate risk? What does you know happen when there was that an eruption and it went uh, downstream? Almost all airline uh, travel in uh, northern uh, Europe uh, was stopped, was cancelled. Why was it stopped? Because something that you may not all, well, none of you, I suspect, will know, is that the engines on all planes are owned by the engine manufacturers, not by the airlines. 
They rent them out. Uh, and the uh, airline manufacturers immediately said, gee, this is a risky business. If the plume causes the planes to smash, not everybody's as clever as uh, Moody, that's going to be very bad for aviation, i.e. that's going to be very bad for our rental business. So if we say to the airlines, no renting, for the next two weeks, you don't pay us, we'll lose the two weeks rental, um, that's a good situation for us because we lose two weeks rental, we might lose an enormous amount if planes are uh, smashed. That's one evaluation of risk. The second evaluation was the airlines themselves. Some of them said, well, okay, it would be a pity if a plane went down and we might uh, have uh, difficulty. The big airlines, I don't know about Air India, but the big airlines like British Air said for a few days, well, we, uh, we're losing revenue and customer uh, reputation. Some of the smaller airlines lost their business because they couldn't fly for two weeks and that was an important thing. So there, the uh, um, chairman might have said, well, to hell with the danger, I'm going to fly my plane because otherwise I lose my business. It's a bit tricky. Now the third situation is uh, somebody who comes up and says, I want to fly desperately to, well, from London to Seattle because my mother's dying and I want to see her before she uh, um, dies. My partner is there and I'm going to get married in a day's time and everything is set up and I have to uh, be there. If that person was told, well, there might be a 10% chance that uh, you're going to uh, uh, get into a, an aircraft accident, he or she might say, well, I'll take that chance. My mother's well worthwhile taking a 10% chance or my, my marriage will fall to the ground because I know there's another person who's interested in my partner, so I'm going to go to my marriage. So here's exactly the same risk and each one evaluates it differently according to what they see uh, the uh, value of uh, the uh, consequences. And it was a pity, as I say, some, well, some airlines went to the ground and it was really a pity because there was no, or oh, very little risk that uh, um, the planes would uh, go down partly because they now knew what to do uh, from old Moody and partly uh, because the concentration of particles in uh, these plumes quite way downstream is pretty small. They're dropped out, they're mixed in um, and uh, the problem with Moody is he flew right over the volcano. Um, anyhow, but so what's the uh, uh, effect? Um, initially when it's spreading very much more rapidly than the wind speed, then of course there's no uh, effect at all. So initially it's actually symmetric. Um, but when that spreading gets less and less and it does uh, change, uh, maybe not like the two thirds, but uh, the three quarters and the derivative of that, the velocity changes, it'll play a role. So what we're going to do is to make, uh, uh, write down a series of equations just in two-dimensional uh, form, there's a very, uh, uh, sorry, and time independent because it blows it uh, down here, um, and just in X and Y. The local continuity will say the width will vary, the height will vary, depending, it goes at the wind speed because that's the speed that's uh, dragging it along. It's now different to what I've been talking about. Once it gets to be one-dimensional, uh, how do I make it clear that this is one dimensional? It's being driven by the wind. One dimensional view in that picture? Sorry? In that picture? Well, one, one dimensional, so, sorry, I should say two dimensional. One dimensional is wrong. But what I want to say, it doesn't change in height. It's, the, it's not radially symmetric anymore. It's just how do I do this? I, I should say it's two dimensions. It changes with time. And this could either be a plan view or an elevation. I'm saying that the plume is spreading. The in, uh, in one direction, from, uh, in one direction there is you. In that direction it spreads even more. That's the question that you are trying to It spreads further and further. further and Correct. Further. So if we have a plan view and uh, <laughs> here is uh, Iceland, it's going to spread something like this. So this is a plan view. So here's the eruption center. 
it's going to be axisymmetric coming out here, then it's blown by the wind, and it moves at the wind speed because it's moved by the wind, and buoyancy and everything doesn't play a role anymore. So we are talking about the bending of the plume as opposed to the intrusions. No, no, no. We're gone past the bending of the plume. We're now saying it's come from the volcano, but it doesn't know about that anymore. It doesn't care. It's just sending things down in some, in plan view, it looks like this. It has nothing to do with intrusion then? Depends what you define as an intrusion. N not to do with an axisymmetric intrusion. Definitely not axisymmetric. It's being blown by the wind rather than the fact that it's... The correct, and then goes along the wind. So it's, if you like, it's totally due to the source. It comes up here, then it overshoots and intrudes. <laughs> and then the wind blows it along. So that's quite a lot later. But that's what was seen, and that is what's seen in E, and that's what we saw in that uh, shot I showed you, showed you of uh, K. Um, so what we uh, write down is uh, the local continuity equation, the local momentum equation. Here's the pressure gradient, which we saw before, and this is the drag because that's, uh, I've used different notation, V and U are the, meant to be uh, the same. Uh, this is the uh, drag that, uh, the uh, drag force that the uh, external wind is putting on this relatively thin body. Remember, it's very thin compared to its... Wind uh, speed is capital U. Sorry? Wind the wind uh, speed is capital U, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, I've used, yeah, it's capital U, I have used that at least. Uh, the same, the wind speed is uh, a capital U, uh, the uh, speed in the y direction, uh, opposite to, uh, sorry, at right angles to the wind is uh, V. Now, th this continuity equation says that U on X must balance, we're going to use this uh, balance term because mostly it does work, uh, U on X must uh, balance uh, V on W. W is the width of this uh, plume in plan view. So <coughs> so in plan view, uh, can you show U and... So this, this is X, this is Y, and the width W or the total width is going to be a, a function of x as we go downstream. And capital U is along x. And uh, capital U is along here, yeah. Capital U, yeah. Please do interrupt the... You know, I've seen these slides a few more times than you have, <laughs> so things are obvious to me that... not obvious at all. So, continuity says that uh, U over X must be something like uh, V over the derivative Y, which is uh, the width. Uh, the flux then says we've got the same flux coming uh, through. We're going to neglect uh, entrainment. Uh, says that the uh, speed U, it's all moving at speed U. Uh, H uh, is the... Uh, uh, it's into the board, yeah. It's the... H, do you want? No, no, no. H is, I'm sorry, you're quite right. H is now the height uh, here, how that uh, varies. And, and W is the width of it. As I've written here, uh, but uh, W is the total width. H is going to vary with Y. H is into the No, H is. Uh, H is a little bit into the board. Yeah. Do I want it to be into the board? H, D, Y, X is this way. No, no, H is this way. H is a function of Y. It's not into the board. Um, no, what am I talking about? H is a function of Y. No, 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 sorry, you're quite right. H is, in the is, uh, is a function of Y, but it's into the board, correct. So this is a three-dimensional thing. It is three-dimensional, yeah. There's no doubt it's three-dimensional. I'm sorry. I can't draw in three dimensions. There's some who think I can't draw in two dimensions. but uh. Anyhow, now we're going to balance terms. And, th and this one here says that uh, h cubed is cd times uh, w v squared over uh, n squared. 
because we've used uh, that. This says that u h times the width is going to go like q. We forget about uh, two pi's and things like that. And that predicts that the width should increase like x to the one third. So x to the one third along the line here. Uh, and these uh, constant. Now the drag coefficient is not known to within probably 10, 20 percent. Uh, so uh, this is a simplified uh, version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, W changes uh, with X. Yeah, that's the V. What do you have along Yeah, but that's that's this term here. W is, the, uh, that, uh, w is the width, but there is a, a velocity V that changes in in the y direction. V is this velocity here. So th that's why we have. A, d a v y here, but we uh, represent represent our uh, derivative with respect to y as just one over w. You have to multiply the transverse velocity with the thickness. Yeah. I guess my question is, you are averaging across across w. You are averaging across w. Correct. Well, balancing, if you like, or averaging across w, but saying the derivatives in that direction if you like, average with w. That there's going to be some velocity profile here, which I haven't yet determined. We have average into the board. Sorry? We have average into the board. Into the board, there is no variation. No, no, there's no variation. It's across the board. That's why you get it into the board. Yes, no, he's just multiplied by h because of that. I'm just saying that ddy uh, is equal to, whoops, not equal to, is proportional to 1 on w. Y is in this direction. There's no D D Z. There's no variation with Z in this because it intrudes. What we're assuming that the buoyancy frequency stays the same. Of course, it does vary. This is not a detailed. Uh, uh, it varies well both with time and with the position over two weeks, without a doubt. But we're assuming that the, the buoyancy frequency is constant. So there's no variation with Z. It's just flowing through here, but it's flowing. What do we say? Like x to the uh, third. So it starts at x equals zero. And then it goes downstream and it should go like that. Okay, so that uh, says now we're uh, solving the equations uh, properly. Here's uh, the source. Initially, it has to be radially uh, symmetric. The wind is going uh, down uh, here and the uh, flow patterns will look like this. And here's the thickness h. Uh, <coughs> quite thick here, but uh, if you like, this region here must be described by what I did uh, here, and then the wind takes over and uh, down it uh, goes, but it spreads. <coughs> this is now some observations from, oh, it doesn't say, but this is some observations from uh, E, here's uh, Iceland, here's the uh, source, uh, uh, sorry, here's, yeah, here's the source, and the interesting thing is, um, <coughs> the Icelandic airport is about here. That was about the only place in northern Europe where planes were allowed to take off and land, <laughs> the place where the volcano was, because the wind, and they knew that, is uh, pretty steadily uh, to the uh, southeast. Uh, and here's the one-third. Uh, this is the data that I got uh, somewhere. Uh, and here's the one-third, and you see it doesn't uh, at all badly agree with the uh, spreading. But the one-third is pretty slow and it can go a long way and just be in a rather tight uh, business, which was not quite understood. Uh, you know, I'm going to leave this slide out, which just because of the time, which just says that I've been talking about buoyancy and the Met Office talks about advection diffusion and you can look at how important advection diffusion is compared to buoyancy by looking at the Peclet number. That's the equivalent of the Reynolds number, a velocity 
times a length scale over a diffusivity. If the Peclet number is large, then uh, diffusion doesn't play a role. Just like it, when the Reynolds number is large, viscosity doesn't play a role. And you can calculate the uh, Peclet number and you find that uh, uh, the vertical Peclet number typically is 1,000 in a day and then goes down to 30 in 10 days. The horizontal Peclet number is 10 to the fifth. You know, these are far too large. You can compare them with Reynolds numbers. Nobody would say that <coughs> viscosity is important at these Reynolds numbers. Nobody could say that diffusion is important at these Peclet Well, they shouldn't say that diffusion is important at these Peclet numbers, but they did. Okay, so now I'll end here with some take-home uh, messages uh, summarising both lectures. Buoyant turbulence plus rise. Entrainment uh, is important with the uh, vertical velocity proportional to the inflow uh, velocity. They reach a final height in a stratified medium that uh, goes like... What's this? Uh, the B, the buoyancy flux, uh, look like an 8 for a moment, uh, uh, over n cubed all to uh, the quarter. I think this is the second largest extrapolation of laboratory data. Because remember I told you <coughs> Stuart Turner did his experiments initially on 6 uh, inches and I showed you the graph from 6 inches um, to... Uh, <coughs> Uh, something, uh, well, in, in the volcanoes, which I showed you, something like 43 kilometres. I think it's the second largest. I'll leave you to think about what is the largest extrapolation of late, uh, large, uh, laboratory data. And I'm questioning the second, but I think that's right. Uh, large intrusions occur in uh, the oceans, uh, in the atmospheres, as we've seen with volcanic eruptions, and lakes. Uh, water is released in lakes, or uh, there may be a whole series of ways, uh, they behave as steadily evolving tons. They behave like this, not like the Met Office uh, said, capped by an evolving front, and I've gone over turn. That's it.